Hello, it's Lillian, and today we are going to, at last, conclude this Tower of God lore video about the RAO with this third part where we will talk about the four highest ranked rankers as well as the most powerful and influential non-rankers of the tower. This video is made to be watched after the two previous parts about the RAO, so if you didn't see them, or if you need a quick refresher, I suggest you go and see them before continuing with this one. Anyway, let's not waste time and talk about the most powerful beings of the tower. Urek Mazino Before Jihad became active again, he was the strongest active ranker in the whole tower. He is 1M95 tall, and his sobriquet is Rei Barracuda. Rei refers to his combat style, since it is said that he shoots Shinsu at light speed, even if it surely is another exaggeration. While Barracuda refers to the name of the most aggressive white steel eel in the whole tower. His sobriquet is often shortened to Barracuda. Meanwhile, his true name Urek is inspired from the generic term rockfish, Uriok in Korean, which designates the entirety of fishes living in submarine rocks. On the other hand, Mazino refers to the extraordinary great and glorious Maginot Line, an extraordinary wall of defense built by our great country, France, in order to protect from a potential German attack after the First World War. It will end up being completely useless though, since the Nazi armies will just pass it by the side during the Second World War, no need to be a genius, huh? Anyway, I am not teaching history, you can check the Wikipedia page if it suits your interests. Urik is also Wolheiksong's vice-captain, and the person who climbed the tower the fastest in its history, that is to say, in only 50 years. Besides, he is the irregular that we know the best, aside for Rachel and Baum. Thus there is a lot to say about him, which is why I will try to stay concise. We don't know when exactly but Urek Mazina was chasing after Phantominum and followed him inside the tower. Since Yuri met Phantominum in Jihad's palace and that she is around 500 years old, we can suppose that Urek entered the tower around the same time, which marks his entrance as a very recent event in the history of the tower. He climbed the tower super quickly, and notably passed Arie Hon's special test at the 100th floor like I detailed just before. He cleared the hell train, met the god of guardians, and let a trace of his corrupted data into the hidden floor. He also met Baek Rian during his ascension, and created the Wolhike song with him after becoming a ranker. There are quite a lot of things I already told about him in the video, like the time he kidnapped Robert Isand, or the time he fought Quadrado. There is also everything concerning the creation of Wolhaik Song and his friendship with Bek Ryun that I am reserving for an upcoming video. It's a good thing for me because there is already a lot of stuff to talk about concerning his fighting capabilities. There is a lot to tell about his personality or his relationships he has with other characters. To begin with, he is very confident in himself, with a touch of arrogance, well, he is legitimate about it. And it's notably because of that that he calls a lot of people baby. He is very respected by men but overall, he seems to be hated by all the women he encounters and there are always dirty rumors about him. In truth, he is a very sympathetic person. He is always trying to help his friends and the people he deems worthy of receiving his help. He is in love with Garam Jahad, but she rejects him. He is friends with Yuri Jahad, even though she is always throwing insults at him. His best friend is Bek Ryun, like I already said. Uruk was also friends with Heljo, and it seems that Uruk often goes to drink alcohol with Yuchun, one of Jahad Empire's three lords. Concerning the ten great families, we know that Kun Edan would like to battle Urek and that Arya Hon confessed that Urek was better than himself. Plus, there's the fact that Urek and Gustang do not get along. This is because Gustang considers Wolhek Song as something like a deception, and Urek hates the fact that Gustang looks at normal people like he does at insects. On the topic of Jihad, it seems obvious that the arrival of a person as powerful and unpredictable as Urek is not a good thing, but they do not seem hostile towards each other, Urek refusing to attack him even though he loves Garam Jahad. We don't know whether it is because he thinks that he might be unable to beat him, but personally, I think that it is because of the threat it would create on his friends. We know that Jahad is ruthless, and were Urek to attack him, Jahad would surely attack Urek's friends from Wolhaik Song back. Urek and Wolhaik Song rankers may be strong, but they would be powerless when faced with Jahad's army, the family heads and Jahad himself together, that would be tantamount to suicide. Urek also does not care about the politics of the tower, since his only goal is to leave the tower, it is obvious that he prefers not to create useless conflicts, even though his impulsive actions can create tensions. At last, he displayed interest towards Baum since their first encounter at the 21st floor, while Urek did not know that Baum was an irregular. On the other hand, Baum is interested in Urek's stories about the world outside of the tower, as he mentioned them during their second encounter at the floor of death. About Urek's combat capabilities, well, there is a lot of stuff to say. For starters, despite the fact that his position is fisherman, he has a perfect mastery of the entirety of the other positions, and he is very aggressive in each of them. Once, while he was in the most remote position, he managed to shoot down an enemy light bearer who was also the farthest removed from the battlefield. 
SIU as the big soccer fan that he is, compared this to a goalkeeper scoring from his soccer cage, making the ball cross the whole field. The floor of death arc displayed this unfathomable power. We saw him endangering Karaka's life, a high ranker, using only his index charged at 1% of his power. We also witnessed what one of his 10% strikes against Heljo, giving us these incredible panels. It is also during this arc that Po Bidao Gustang affirmed not wanting to contradict Urek, lest his family be exterminated. And let's be reminded that we are talking about one of the 10 great families. Urek possesses incredible physical strength which can be qualified as surreal to the eyes of any regular or ranker. Remember his punching attack against Heljo at 10% of his power? Well, this was only made of raw strength, there is no Shinsu, it's only the shockwave from his punch. He also possesses a tolerance to Shinsu so great that no lighthouse can stop him in a significant manner, as a lighthouse of opera caliber could only stop him for a tenth of a second. There is also his agility and speed which are both extraordinary, as it was demonstrated on the floor of death. People who have seen Urek in combat describe his fighting style as aggressive, ferocious and fast but very beautiful. At last he has a great mastery of Shinsu, I think it's apparent enough. Especially it's important to notice that the enormous shockwave he generated when facing Heljo was only worth a tenth of his strength, and that most of all, this was a single attack. Nothing prevents him from chaining this kind of attacks consecutively, even at 100%, all while adding Shinsu to these attacks. We can easily imagine that a fight between him and a high ranker near his spot in the rankings would certainly ravage a good part of a floor, despite the fact that their size is bigger than the American continent. To conclude, in order to drive the point of his dangerosity home, on the floor of death, we saw him literally distort space in order to move instantaneously to Gustang. The latter suggested that it was an extremely dangerous technique because in case of an error, it would have severe consequences on the entirety of the living beings in the floor of death. All this lets us perceive what he could really be capable of in a real fight at 100%. In conclusion, Urek's place in the history of Tower of God is very peculiar. He is a bit like a UFO, he comes out of nowhere, makes shambles out of the pre-established order while not even wanting to meddle in the political conflicts of the tower, as his sole goal is to find an exit, to escape the tower in order to return to the outside world from whence he came. All of that while making his friends benefit from that. As SIU said, in his end of chapter notes, for chapters 224 and 250 of season 2, that Urek would be a character that would be explored deeper later in the story as well as his relationship to Garam Jahad. He surely still stays a hard character to manage since, because of his nice personality and strength, he could arrange basically every pinch situation without breaking a sweat. Thus, and happily for the good of the scenario, there is an individual just above him in the rankings who seems to be the final antagonist of Tower of God's story, I obviously mean. Jahad there's so much stuff to say, analyze or to theorize about Jihad that he could own a video to himself. Jihad is the king of the tower, or at least of its 134 first floors. He is currently the best ranked active ranker in the tower, as well as the most influential person, since he rules over the entire tower, and that the tiniest of his acts has repercussions on the entirety of the tower's inhabitants. He is 2m40 tall, and possesses no sobriquet other than king of the tower. He is also the head of the Jihad family which I have already talked about in my video on the Jihad Empire. We ignore whether he has a first name and furthermore we don't even know if Jihad is his last name or his first name. Oh and concerning the writing of his name its true spelling is Zahad, even if it is pronounced Jihad. SIU himself confirmed that in a tweet. Anyway it's not really important, personally I prefer writing Jihad by habit and because I think it's cooler but you do you. His background is linked to the towers so much that it would be enough to watch my video about the history of the tower, the second episode, to know it in detail. But to be brief, several tens of thousands of years, he entered the tower accompanied by his 12 companions who are currently leaders of the 10 great families, to whom we add Arlen Grace and Vij. Jahad conquered the tower during the great journey, and he went through the hell train where he met the god of guardians and where he also inadvertently created the hidden floor. He returned there later, we don't know exactly when, in order to corrupt his data self and erase the data of his companions. After that, during the Age of Ascension, he civilized the tower and put the ranker system into place so that all the inhabitants of the tower could climb it. After some time, he decided to stop the climb at the 134th floor, to block the access to the 135th floor and to make a contract with all the floor administrators in order to become the king of the tower. It is also during that period that he proposed to Arlen Grace, to which she refused. Arlen Grace and V being opposed to Jihad's plans, a great conflict between them was about to occur, thus marking the beginning of the Genesis War era. Jihad won this great war and made himself king of the tower, banishing Arlen Grace and V as fugitives. 
Arlen Grace got pregnant with Balm during her escape, and when Jihad learnt of that, he tracked and killed the child in front of her eyes. But once the Great War was over, there was a long period of conflict, notably because of the establishment of Fug. It's around that time that Jihad appeared in front of Kel Helam, and Jihad ended up giving two options to the rebels, coexistence or extermination. Thus, the age of coexistence began. During this long period, Jihad became inactive but continued nonetheless to manipulate others in order to strengthen his reign, like with the Princess of Jihad system that he willingly corrupted. Also, it is said that when Phantominum appeared, he went to see Jihad before disappearing just as he appeared, even though no one really knows what occurred between those two. Jihad went out of hibernation after the activation of his trap in the hidden floor and then, when he issued the three orders just after. Jihad's relationships to others are almost non-existent, because he never shows himself in front of anyone since the beginning of the Age of Coexistence. We know that the Tower inhabitants, regulars and even rankers and high rankers often worship him as an authentic god, be it because of his omnipresent influence in the whole tower despite never showing himself, or because of the propaganda, and because of the cult of his personality within his empire. See the episode on the Empire of Jihad. There are also various people who hate him to the death, principally people from Fug, but Jihad does not care the least about them. In truth, to find traces of relationships of people with Jihad, we have to go back to the Age of Ascension as well as the era of the Great Journey. At the time, Jihad seemed quite the open person since Hajinsung got some opportunities to talk with him. The oldest members from the Ten Great Families must have had the opportunity to see him as well, but the only ones who really truly knew Jihad must have been his companions from the Great Journey such as Quadrado, Molik 1PGR, Luslek, or simply his 12 fellows from the beginning. Currently, the relationships between him and his 10 companions have become cold and distant. Only the family head of the Lopobia family seems to really support Jihad at 100%. It is revealed that Jihad and Kunidan don't get along, and that Pobido Gustang even declared that they were enemies. As is it known, despite everything that happened in the past, Jihad still cannot forget about Arlen Grace, and this is why he corrupted the Princess of Jihad's system, in order not to marry another woman. Everyone also knows that Jihad and V had completely polarized personalities which used to provoke various arguments that Arlen had to stop. At last, concerning Jihad's relationship to Baum, it is quite peculiar, as Jihad literally already killed Baum once, and tried to kill him anew in the hidden floor, all while precising that he would kill every last person Baum had encountered in his life. Jahad showed numerous times that he was extremely cold and cruel, as it is known, for instance, that he did not hesitate to curse the descendants of the people who had rebelled against him, nor did he hesitate to exterminate all the descendants of the natives once, well, almost all of them. Even if, once upon a time he used to act impulsively, like it was the case with Arlen interventions, he currently seems completely hollow and devoid of any emotions. He seems to be indifferent to the fate of his old companions as he did not falter even a second, as he gave the order to annihilate Pobi Dagustang's family, nor to erase the data of his old companions within the hidden floor, except for Kunidans. Jahad is also very manipulative, as he demonstrated it by turning the princess of Jahad's system to his advantage. He is a perfect king of sorts, flawless, as if he was fated to rule. Besides, this notion of fate is very important and may encompass a very important part of the plot, with Jahad pretending to be able to control destiny itself. His current personality is totally opposed to the one he had when he met the God of Guardians, because at the time, he was very similar to Baum. He only wanted to make all the inhabitants of the tower happy. There would be so much to say about his evolution. Thus, I will refrain from talking too much about it. But it is clear that Baum and him are very alike in some aspects. Concerning his fighting prowess, there are equally too many things to say. Very few people saw him in action but his incredible abilities are known to all, even if they are far from conceiving the summit of his power. He is known as the greatest fisherman in the tower. It also seems like he possesses a certain foresight ability. He is indeed capable of seeing fate, besides the fact that as an irregular himself, he can also modify it in unpredictable ways. He is so agile using his foresight that once coupled with his status of irregular, he manages to trap and return other people's abilities to see fate against them, like with Kel Helm or Guides. He also has a very weird power that looks like a sort of demon with red tendrils, as we have seen during the Hidden Floor arc. He also knows how to use spells as he could trap the woman who then became the ghost in the 13 month series. It is also known that his blood is so strong that no woman can seemingly bear his child, and that giving a small bit of it with the Princess of Jihad method for the selected women to become a lot stronger. He is immortal just like his fellow companions, but he also cannot be killed thanks to another contract with the administrator. This makes it so that only an irregular, who is not submitted to the rules of the tower, can attack him. Jihad is a master at close quarters, is tremendously fast, is super agile, enduring, and has otherworldly reflexes and physical strength. All that coupled with the Shinsu control of a genius. 
It suffices to see the fights of his data self against Bam or against Kun Edan's or Kun Masheni's data selves in the hidden floor to realize that in spite of only being in the beginnings of his ascension of the tower, he was extremely strong in these areas. Now imagine what he could be capable of today after tens of thousands of years have passed. The only time we saw him fight since he became the king of the tower was in Kel Helm's flashback, where he annihilates all of Kel Helm's team by creating giant golden needles, a skill we had already seen him use as his data self in the hidden floor, which gives an appreciation of its evolution. By the way, this skill is called Golden Needle from Mystery Island. It is also common knowledge that his data used to wield a needle called Lacalicus, or the Needle of War. It is a very powerful needle which possesses three forms. The first is called Lacalicus. It is white and has quite the unusual shape for a needle, since it looks more like a sword. The second form is Coelacanth. It is red and resembles a needle more. And finally, there is Leviathan, the third form, where it becomes blood red. It is not clear whether Jihad still holds this weapon as his true self, or rather, as a fraction of his current power, has three at his belt when he descended onto the hidden floor. One of them may be Lycalicus, even though it is highly likely that since then he obtained numerous weapons that are a lot more powerful than Lycalicus. In the end, Jihad seems to be the principal antagonist of Tower of God. In truth, everything seems to revolve around him. All the plot threads are linked to him. At the same time, he appears as near invincible. He is extremely powerful, immortal and unkillable, commanding a gigantic empire for which no serious opponent exists. Even more than that, Jihad seems flawless. He is very clever, manipulative, cold and cunning, as if he had no emotions. He doesn't show any gap to his opponents, and to top it all off, seems to be able to control fate itself. This is the enemy that Bam must face. In spite of all that, however, there are still two individuals higher than him in the rankings. Two people who surpass him despite his veil of invincibility. And the next of these people, the number two of these rankings is... Enryu. He is one of the most mysterious characters in the tower. No one knows where he is currently or what he currently does. He is nicknamed Red Tower, as the tower's Shinsu turns red in his trail. He is an irregular who seems to have entered the tower directly from the 43rd floor. He is 1m84 tall, and he is the spear bearer. SIU also declared that he was the most handsome man in the tower. The reason Enryu is in degree 2 of the rankings is because he managed to do two things that were previously thought impossible before in the tower. The first is that Enryu created life using Shinsu. We ignore what he may have exactly created, still he is the only one in the tower's history to have done it despite being a rumor. The second is that killed the 43rd floor's administrator. The floor administrators were until then considered as invincible, and even a being such as Jihad had to submit to them. One thing that seemed completely unthinkable in the eyes of all the inhabitants of the tower, as the administrators are considered as immortal and eternal gods. What drove him to do this though? In fact, Enru is only the messenger of the outside god. He came to the 43rd floor in order to deliver the thorn to Baum. As soon as he arrived, he declared, only those who believe in the false king will remain here and face death. Seeing that he was not an ordinary person, a lot of people fled, but Jihad's fanatics attacked him. Enryu attacked them with an uncountable number of Shinsu spears. According to an observer, there were more than 9,000 of them. It's just a joke from SIU referring to Dragon Ball. Vegeta, what does the scouter say about his power level? It's over 9,000! What? The but it gives an idea. The fanatics were all decimated. Then, the administrator appeared completely furious. A fight of extreme violence started. The administrator changed shapes numerous times while fighting, but its body, that everyone thought invincible, was being pierced from all sides by Enryu's attacks. Even his ability to control all the Shinsu on the floor was of no avail against Enryu. All this transformed the 43rd floor in a place where the rules of the tower do not exist anymore. Enryu then hid the thorn fragment in what is now called the Floor of Death, and disappeared. Thus Enryu is someone with a god-ranked mastery of Shinsu given that it even surpasses that of administrators and that he was able to create life. A mastery so great that it places him above the rules of the tower, a mastery one might call heretical. Besides that, he is the person who has mastered the most bangs in the tower's history, and it is approximately all that we know about him. Enryu is a very mysterious and intriguing character. There are rumors saying Hedon is searching for him. If it is really the case, it is very surprising that he still was not found, since Hedon is the sole administrator to be omnipresent in the whole tower, and not only on his floor. It is also strange that in spite of his opposition towards Jihad, he did not go to kill Jihad by himself, since it shouldn't be that much of a problem, given how superior to Jihad he is. Concerning a future appearance, SIU confirmed that Enryu would show himself again in the last parts of the story.
First, before seeing what lies in first place, I wanted to make a quick review of the very influential non-regulars who do not have a spot in the rankings simply because of the fact that they are not regulars, especially since some of them are not even human. They are the honorable mentions of sorts. We could mention the non-regular Yon Iliad first, as I already explained, she is the woman who gives birth to all the children of the Yon family, in place of Yon Hana, which makes her the most influential women of that family after Yon Hana. There are also Arvin Lu and Kesa the Furious, ministers of wisdom and defense respectively, who do not look like regulars, even though that judgment is completely hypothetical. Of course there is also Jaina Repelista Jahad, the sole princess of Jahad, who is neither a regular or a ranker. She holds great influence not only because of her Jahad princess status, but also because she has an opera, allowing her to observe any place in the tower. After that, we could also mention the important people affiliated to the workshop, who are all non-regulars. For instance, the blacksmith, Ashul Edwaru, who made the 13-month series weapons from half the key leading to the 135th floor, and besides that, who also happens to be author of a book called The Weapons of the Tower, which holds a lot of interesting information about Shinsu as well as weapons. There are also the four great teachers of the workshop, Mad, Max, Mai and Mei, all four of them beings who were artificially created by Maxeth. There is also Flux, one of the three lords of Jihad Empire as well as one of the fathers of the workshop, detentor of enormous influence as well as being another artificially created being by Maxeth. Finally there's Maxeth. He is the founder as well as the leader of the workshop, and as such, he is by far one of the most influential individuals, if not the most influential one in the tower. The workshop is a gigantic organization that was even present before Jihad's arrival in the tower. They are the ones from which the near entirety of the weapons and tools that are mostly used in the tower originate from. All of this is led by one man, Maxeth, a man capable of creating artificial beings, a man who is also much older than Jihad and his companions, a man who created essential items such as the pocket. His influence is truly impressive in spite of his neutral political alignment. There would be plenty more to talk about or theorize about the workshop, but I will talk about it in a later video about the workshop. Then we could mention the category of characters who are either dead or missing, but whose influence can still be felt. The best examples of that are Arlen Grace and V first and foremost, V was one of Jihad's original 12 companions, an irregular then, as well as Arlen Grace's husband. We know of his background since we often mentioned it, and we especially know that it ended in his suicide after the death of Arlen's child. He only left behind a single message pleading Arlen to forget it all and come back to her former companions. Well in any case it's the version that is told to us by Arlen but taking into account her crazed state at the time, who knows what really occurred. Aside from that, we know almost nothing about V. Data Kun. Idan also noted that among the 12 companions of Jihad, even though Eurasia Blossom was the best Shinsu wielder, V was the one whose Shinsu tension was the most intense. We are also aware of the fact that V is not his true name, but only an affectionate nickname Arlen used to give him. V's influence can still be felt in the current day tower, since it is one of his servants, Grace Mercea Luslek, who founded Fug, that is today the principal opponent to Jihad. As for Arlen Grace I am not going to retell you her story again, but instead focus on how she ended up. After V's suicide, Arlen used a mysterious spell in order to prevent her dead child's body to rot, which demonstrates her mastery of spells in hopes that she may find a way to bring it back to life. She wandered the tower for a long time like a ghost to find an exit. She ended up finding one, offered her child, or rather, its corpse to the god of the outside, and then the god resurrected the child. She then made the prophecy that this child would return to the tower, would obtain the thorn brought by the messenger of the outside god, Enryu, that this child would avenge those who made her suffer, and that he would lead everyone on the tower to new heights. We ignore everything that ensued, but a very intriguing element leads us to believe that she was alive not that far back is Rachel's simple sentence at the end of the hidden floor. Arlen used to call you a monster, hinting at the possible relationship between Rachel and Arlen. This sentence in itself is the topic of many theories in any case we don't know anything about her current state. We don't know whether she is dead or alive and if she is alive what she is doing and where, etc. In any case her current influence is tremendous. Since thanks to her, Enryu entered the tower, Balm resurrected and entered tower, and it's also thanks to her that Bam was born. She also seems to embody Jahad's only weakness, that in spite of time past, cannot yet forget about her. To resume, she is at the heart of the plot, and without her, the story of Tower of God would simply not exist. To continue, we could mention the giant as well, who, in the ancient lore of the tower, split itself into five beings, each controlling one element. Those beings would be called Native Ones. We don't know what the Native Ones ended up becoming, but they had to be extremely powerful since their descendants were already very powerful too, as some of them were Jihad's companions. We have no idea where native ones can be found, or even if they are still alive, 
but it is said that their direct descendants have supposedly all been exterminated by Jihad, the only known exception being Ruck. There are also the Ancients, these strange creatures whom we ignore almost everything about, except that they take hosts in some characters. The only two that have appeared so far reside in Kale Helm's and Evan Kale's bodies. We could note that their powers were extremely dangerous, in spite of not even fighting at full strength. Some Shinho, like the Barracuda, said to be the most violent and hostile in the tower, or the Killer Whale, the most powerful ones are also honorable mentions. Often forgotten are the floor administrators. They are known to be at least 134 of them, since there are 135 floors, and the 43rd floor's administrator is dead, but there could be more of them. Administrators are like gods on their floor since they control all the Shinsu there and seem all-seeing. Everyone thought of them as immortals until Enryu killed one of them. Jihad himself could only bow to these creatures, which in terms of brute force would lead to Jihad losing 134 spots in the rankings if Guardians were in it. Among these administrators there is a special one, one that sticks out from the rest, and it is Hedon. Hedon sorts out the individuals who become regulars. Regulars, although beneath irregulars are in general beings that have an influence on the tower. As such we can consider Hedon as one of the most influential persons in the tower. On that note there are a number of ambiguous points about him. Numerous elements tend to let us think that he may be the true mastermind of this story, but as usual I will refrain from theorizing. It is a lore video, I have to stick to the facts. Ultimately, there is still one being left whom we know nothing about, but which is certainly the most powerful, the only one that may rival the end degree one of this ranking. I am talking about the outside god. In order to imagine one moment the extent to which this being is powerful, just realize that someone as powerful as Enryu was only his messenger. Just think that he was also literally able to resurrect someone, even though some doubts linger around this phenomenon. It is highly likely this outside god is an Nexus user. What is an Nexus user, you ask? Well, I will try to explain that to you along the number one of this ranking. And the number one of these rankings, the one being to dominate every single being living in the tower, the true god of the tower, I obviously mean. Paracule. He is the ultimate being of the tower, the most powerful, the one whose powers cannot be spoken nor described. He is the individual whose mere presence seems to defy all logic and reason. Some even say that one would find him at the very top of the tower, as he is the answer to all your questions. He embodies everything existing in this world, everything you could ever desire. Yes, it's him, Paracule. Anyway, sorry for that one, coming back to being serious. However, yes, don't hesitate to join the Paracule fan club, we are a lot in it. The number one of the rankings is obviously Phantominum. He is without a doubt the most mysterious character in Tower of God, no one knows his motivations. He entered the tower one day, stormed Jahad's palace and atrociously killed numerous members of the Jahad family, many of whom were very powerful high rankers. He met Yuri but didn't kill her for a reason we ignore. Yuri never told anything about that event, except that Phantominum was a dirty one. Phantominum ended up breaking all the defense lines of the palace and faced Jahad, but then disappeared without a single clash of needles. Since then, no one ever saw him again. His mysterious appearance and disapparition in the tower, on top of being an electroshock for the whole tower, will spawn many questions without answers, which is why he would earn the sobriquet riddle. The other reason for that was his combat style. It is said that he had an unpredictable fighting style and that he used a weapon that had never been seen in the tower. Most of the eyewitnesses are dead or became completely crazy, which is why the reports on the events that occurred during his short appearance weren't reported in an exact manner. The trauma created by Phantominum was so big that it gave birth to the term irregular, a term that would later become a symbol of fear in the whole tower, and that would have a big impact on Uric Mazino too. During his ascension, that took place at approximately the same time since it is said that he was pursuing Phantominum. Phantominum would also become the root cause for the change of the level of tests at the second floor, which would become harder to weed out the new regulars who would be too dangerous for the tower, preventing them from climbing it. The true goal of the tests at the second floor had thus become to maintain the political stability of the tower, in spite of the fact that its original purpose was to evaluate the talents of the regulars. There would be numerous objections in the RAO on the topic of putting Phantominum in first place of the rankings, notably because of his disappearance, but everyone agreed on the fact that his strength alone was too great compared to everything known until then. 
Since then, every ranker fears the eventual return of this monster. Indeed, after what he did, it is certain that no one can fight him on equal terms. However, some people debate about who would win between him and Enryu in a fight. This debate is due to a lack of information from the people in the tower, because Enryu would have no chance of winning against Phantominum, and this for a single reason only irregulars may know. Phantominum is an Exus user, and this is where it gets complicated. Indeed, to talk about what an Exus user is, I must quickly explain what Tulsa user story is. I will resume it very briefly because there will be an entire lore video about Tulsa user story and it will be the last lore video about Tower of God as it perfectly concludes this series and it will surely be one of the longest and most difficult videos to do. Anyway, I don't know if you noticed it but for every new chapter, when you see the title of the chapter with the usual layout, you can see on top the small label Tulsa user story by Slave in Utero. We know what Slave in Utero refers to, it's the author's pen name which we often shorten as SRU. But what does Tulsa user story refer to? Well, it's the name of the universe in which Tower of God's story takes place, Talsa User Story. All of SIU's old comics, except for only one of them, that take place in this universe have been taken out of the internet by SIU himself, because he considered that they told too much about Tower of God's story, and only fragments of those old stories have been found by the Korean fans. And in this universe there exist beings called Exus Users, Phantominum being one of them, and he is the only one of his kind that we know of in Tower of God, SIU having confirmed that Enryu was not one of them, However, we can also imagine that the outside god is one too. An Exus user is originally a normal human being who awakened after an unknown process to become a being that could be called the equivalent of a god. Exus users possess a power so great that even the strongest non-Exus user could not win against the weakest Exus user. Since Phantominum is an Exus user, only another Exus could win against him. Yet, there isn't a single one in the tower, hence his number one spot. Exus can generate a space around them in which they can use a unique power that cannot be negated nor denied and allow them to control an aspect of reality. Hence, to resume all that, Phantominum is a being capable of literally controlling a facet of reality in a determined zone. Besides, we ignore which aspect it could be since it seems he didn't need to use his Exus powers to infiltrate Jahad's palace and kill so many people. Way to top it off, SIU said Phantominum was one of the most powerful Exus of Talsiuza Story's universe. SIU also said Phantominum would not appear in Tower of God's story, except as a flashback, simply because he is infinitely stronger than anything in the tower. To conclude, and to make you realize the extent to which Phantominum is above them all, SIU declared that he could literally instantaneously destroy the entire tower. This was neither a joke nor a play on words, so who knows, Tower of God's story may end when Phantominum is bored with it. Here we are, this long three-parter video has ended at last, I didn't think it would be that long, and I did intend to make it into one video. Finally though there were so many things to tell that the video considerably lengthened, making me do three parts. It is a video that has to be taken with a pinch of salt, notably because it bases itself for a great part on non-canon lore, notably very old lore that could very well be subject to many changes in the rest of the story. I know that me not talking in detail about Talsa user story may have frustrated you, but there are so many things to tell about it that I had no choice, as the video is already long enough I think. In any case, beyond the rankings itself, there is one thing you must remember. This is that these rankings go way beyond simple raw power rankings. It is a complex system, internal to Tower of God setting, established not only by the author directly, but also by the characters of SIU story, which is then unreliable, may be subject to debate and lack objectivity as well. Well, now that all that has passed we have at last finished all the videos about the Jihad Empire, and we are going to be able to start talking about the other groups in the Tower. Don't hesitate to subscribe to see the next videos, to like if you appreciate them, to comment if you have any questions, or just for referencing, and feel free to share them with those who are a bit lost with these aspects of the law. I also want to thank Azriel who did the translations for the English subtitles of the video, and I welcome every English speaker watching this video. Anyway, we are coming back for the next Tower of God video, in which we will talk about the aforementioned hostile group to the Jihad Empire we have talked about so much, we are going to discover the law of Fug, 